The Volunteer by Renee Thompson. Each summer, Claire and her son Quinn drove from Berkeley to the Northern Rockies, where they pitched a tent at Dulcet National Park and camped for three months for free. In exchange for the campsite, they worked as volunteers, cleaning restrooms, picking up trash, and grooming hiking trails. At the end of their shifts, when the sun drifted low in the crystalline sky, they wandered the banks of the Dulcet River, rods and nets in hand. It was all fly fishing, catch and release, and Quinn was a natural, sometimes hooking up to six rainbow trout, while Claire's line tangled on an outstretched willow, then snapped and lost its fly. Quinn had the rhythm, the musicality to cast, mend, point, and set, and the ability to, to distinguish the nuances of the water, the little blurp a cutthroat made when it slowly surfaced for air, or the quiet spin of a whirlpool as it gathered behind a boulder. Once Quinn caught his fish, he reeled it in and netted it, deftly slipping the hook from the trout's mouth before gently letting it go. Nice one, Claire had said just two evenings prior, an 11 incher at least. I know a dink when I see one, Mom. Don't make me call you a liar. She had smiled, and he had too. But his enthusiasm was fragile. Now more than ever, it seemed he could see through a compliment that wasn't earned. And if they were to repair their relationship, it was up to her to err on the side of saying too little rather than too much. It was her opportunity, this year's trip, to make amends to her son, show him how much she loved him, how non-judgmental she'd become. He'd had a rough go of it the last few months, struggling to make even mediocre grades and withdrawing from friends at high school. When she called Owen, her ex, to talk about it, he told her Owen was 16 years old, acting out, that he'd get over it. Acting out is missing curfew, not flunking math and English. A C minus isn't flunking, Claire. Give the kids some room. Owen was an anesthesiologist and had left them for her, his nurse, Beth. There was a time when he too would have despaired over their son's changing behavior, but ever since he married Beth and then they had a child, Owen's priorities had shifted. It wasn't uncommon. Claire saw it all the time. Dads remarried, made new kids, and left the old ones far behind. Even if once Quinn had said, I hate him, Mom, she would have understood and might have said it too. Regardless of whatever else was going on in their lives, they always looked forward to the trip. This year, though, Quinn was that much older, and Claire worried he might have lost interest in fishing, and hiking, and bird watching, that he would beg off, saying he wanted to spend time with his few remaining friends. But when she raised the topic of taking the trip, he'd said he wanted to go. And so she packed the car, as she always did, and now here they were at Dulcet. Mondays were busiest. All weekend long, tourists parked at the trailhead to Auburn Lake and then hiked in, hoping to see black bears, grizzlies, and mountain goats. For the most part, visitors were respectful, adhering to the code, leave no trace. But every so often, a carload of kids drove in, parked under the canopy of the old growth forest and dumped trash out of their windows. Claire couldn't count the Coke cans, beer bottles, and cigarette butts she'd picked up. Twice she found used condoms. She remembered Quinn saying once, if they're gonna toss stuff, why don't they toss $5 bills? <laughs> or credit cards, we could sail to Galapagos. Quinn had always yearned to see the island, but then he learned the place was inundated with workers, visitors, and residents, some 200,000 or more. Claire supposed the little island wasn't unlike Dulcet at the height of the tourist season. Wanting to get away was the reason they themselves came to the park, and she and Quinn learned early on to hike in a mile or two, where they'd have a place to themselves. After all the summers they'd spent in the forest, she was still amazed to discover that most people preferred to step from their cars, dump their gear on the flat, dusty ground, and camp at the trailhead. Monday morning, as she climbed from her sleeping bag, the air was cool and smelled of ponderosas. Quinn had gotten up before her. He liked to fish or watch birds in the morning's pink light, and she guessed he'd gone up past Auburn Lake to look for one of his warblers. She hadn't heard him rise, as he had moved quietly, not wanting to disturb her. She glanced at his sleeping bag, saw that he'd taken pains to smooth it and to fluff his pillow, that he'd gone to this effort both pleased and shamed her, as it meant he was still stuck in his rut, doing not what came naturally, but what she knew he wa she wanted, but what he knew she wanted. She would talk to him about it when he came back, bring it up casually, tell him she had changed or was trying to change, and hoping he was trying to. We're in this together, she would say, and maybe he would nod if he wouldn't speak, and she would know he had heard her. 
After a breakfast of Cheerios and milk, she put on a light jacket, deciding to start for the trail without Quinn. Because communication was tricky in the woods, cell phones were useless in the national park, she and Quinn had devised a system. If he was gone when she woke up, she would head to the fallen pine in Jasper's meadow and wait for him near the beehive. It was a routine that had served them well, and so she picked up the grab pole she used for litter, tossed a canvas sack over one shoulder, and started on her way. The morning was beautiful. Lavender mountains in the blue-black distance, and a forest of variegated greens. A bluebird called from a prickly rose, and a flicker from the top of a lodge pole. On the opposite side of the trail, nearest the tent, a creek flowed, its murmur much like the wind that stirred the willows and larches and alders. She had once remarked to Quinn that she couldn't always tell the difference between the sounds of wind and water, and he told her to close her eyes and concentrate, to listen to what she was hearing. And so she strove to begin each day as her son had instructed, which kept her close to nature. Hiking up to where the trail forked, she veered left and then down again, gradually heading westward. Spotting a glint on the ground, a breath mint wrapper, she picked it up and dropped it in her bag. She also found a triangle of styrofoam, a wad of duct tape, and those items, too, went in the bag. The trail presented few problems so far, and she was hopeful the eight-mile loop would be equally manageable. In the distance, she heard the steady thrum of the highway. The park's main entrance was on the west side and subject to heavy traffic. Just ahead, where the trail opened into their designated meadow meeting place, she saw a truck on the road above her. She recognized the driver as a third-year ranger whom she hadn't seen all summer. She waved, and he slowed and looked in her direction. When it seemed he hadn't seen her, she waved again, more eagerly this time, and then he must have spotted her as he slowly raised one arm. Dropping farther down the trail, she headed for Jasper's meadow toward the hum of the massive hive that Quinn had discovered in the fallen ponderosa the previous summer. He had wanted her to see it and had pulled her from the trail. She had run with him, skating across the grass, her canvas bag bumping against one hip. The hive, lodged deep within the wood, the log, contained thousands of bees, and she was afraid to get too close. Quinn, though, held no such worries and stepped forward for a better look. Careful, Claire told him. He seemed not to have heard, however, as he turned one ear toward the great vibration coming from the hive. He seemed to be listening hard as he was leaning, and his ear turned toward the source of the sound, his lips slightly parted. She waited, watching, wondering what he was hearing. As she watched, bees began gathering in a knot over his head. Quinn, she said, and when he didn't respond, she repeated his name, fighting irritation. He looked up, startled. What, he said. She was tempted to chastise him, to tell him he was behaving carelessly. Instead, she strove her middle ground, forced to laugh, and asked, what language are they speaking? Recollecting that discussion now, as she walked along, she checked her watch. She hoped that by some chance Quinn was already at Jasper Meadow, but as soon as she got within 100 yards of their agreed-upon spot, she could see he wasn't there. She had a good view of the entire valley, but as she swept her gaze across the green and brown grass, then up the hills and back down toward the meadow, she saw no sign of him. Her jaw and stomach tightened. She walked more quickly now, thinking perhaps he'd already been at the log, that he'd left a note saying he would meet her somewhere else. Yet when she got there, there was no note and no bees at all. The hive was utterly abandoned. Claire had heard the bees. She knew she had. Their hum was as distinct and vibrant as the day Quinn had first brought her there. But as she looked toward the highway, a two-lane road that wound around Dulcet, she understood with a profound relief that the hum had come from the cars. Clouds gathered and the wind picked up. Claire's light jacket was no longer sufficient. She brusquely rubbed her arms. Walking across the meadow toward the trail, she concentrated on where exactly Quinn said he would meet her. Perhaps she'd misunderstood him or hadn't properly conveyed where she planned to go. As she contemplated what might have happened, she came upon a hole in the ground, a tunnel dug by a badger. Someone had blocked its entrance with a two-liter plastic bottle, which seemed a cruel thing to do. She picked up the bottle, suspecting that whoever had done it had had a good laugh. It was disappointing, but no longer shocking to know that even here in a national park, people could be mean and thoughtless. This cruelty brought to mind another time, when Quinn had badly hurt her. It had seemed such a benign gesture, her brushing the hair from his forehead, but he resented it, and had knocked her hand away. Mom, leave it, okay? Owen had told her that day on the phone to give Quinn a little room, and at the time, she considered the advice inappropriate, 
After all, she was Quinn's mother, not his friend. But from that day forward, she'd bitten her tongue and when she wanted to chide him, and now he occasionally confided in her, although she supposed, like any mother, she would always yearn for more. She dropped the bottle into her sack and smoothed the dirt around the hole. Looking up, she spotted two hikers approaching, a man and a woman wearing overstuffed backpacks. The man wore a brace around one knee, and the woman used a walking stick. Europeans, Claire thought, based on their shoes. Clunky, round-toed, buckled affairs with thick rubber soles. They said hello and stopped a moment to chat. We saw a cow elk and her calf, the man said, turning and gesturing north. My God, they were beautiful. We didn't bother them, the woman reported. We only took one photograph. Two, actually, the man said. He struggled modestly, adding, they never even saw us. Claire liked the man and woman right away. You could tell they were decent people. If you're packing trash, he said, holding up her sack, I'll haul it in for you. Oh, no, no, said the man. We don't have far to go now. Claire stepped off the path, allowing the couple to pass. Well, have a good day, then, she called after them. At the last moment, she said, oh, wait, before you go, I'm wondering if you have happened to see a teenage boy, light brown hair down to his shoulders, blue hoodie and binoculars. The couple stopped, turned, and looked at one another. No, said the woman congenially. We haven't seen anyone since starting down. We are a little surprised to see you. Me? Why? It's the end of the season. We're late getting down. Oh, Claire said. No, you're not late at all. Tons of visitors are still pouring in. You were too far up the mountain to hear them. The couple exchanged another glance, and Claire supposed they too considered traffic in the park a mixed blessing, that an interest in nature meant an explosion of people, nearly all of them in cars. Well, it was nice meeting you, she said, seeing the couple had nothing more to say and guessing they wanted to go. They told her it was nice meeting her too, and they walked ahead. And as they walked ahead, she didn't call after them a second time, didn't tell them she was meeting her son, or how once reunited they would sit in the shade at a picnic table and eat a tomato sandwich. Claire picked up the pace, sliding a bit as she navigated the downward slope of the trail. Dipping below the branches of a low-reaching aspen, she rounded a bend and came across the parking lot where the ranger station sat. She walked directly to the picnic tables, seeing again that Quinn wasn't there. She felt the old fury, wondering why it wasn't more thoughtful when she was doing everything she possibly could to ensure they got along. But the moment she thought it, she let it go, as that was the point exactly. She, he was trying, she knew he was, struggling to cope with the distractions in his head. His troubles had started in earnest 12 months ago at this very park. She and Quinn had drove, driven up alone, even before the divorce, Owen had never wanted to come insisting no one in the medical profession could take that much time off. Within five days of hiking in, Quinn had fallen ill, complaining of a headache and dizziness. Claire dug through her duffel bag, found a bottle of Tylenol, and administered two tablets. But after two days, he, he still wasn't eating and was barely sleeping, and she told him they needed to hike to the car, drive to the ranger station, and call the local clinic. Mom, he said, sitting up, I'm not sick. It's something else. His dark eyes were almost black against his smooth, pale skin, and he fixed his gaze in his lap. Claire sat down next to him, rested her hand on his knee, and told him she was there for him, no matter what he had to tell her. Speaking slowly, quietly, he said, I don't know how to say this exactly, but I'm hearing things. A weird sort of buzzing, or humming, I guess. Every few seconds it kind of breaks up, and I'll hear something, someone or something talking. His chest rose and fell with each breath, and when he glanced up, she could see his eyes were welling. She wanted to tell him not to worry, it was nothing, probably a near infection. But once or twice in Berkeley, when he'd not known she was looking, she had seen him cup his ears. Oh, she hadn't thought much of it, assuming he hated the noise of her classic radio or that some other sound had offended him as traffic offended her. Given what he just told her, however, she was alarmed and insisted they get to the doctor. Quinn clutched his pillow, no, mom. He said, shaking his head. They'll tell me I'm crazy, and I know I'm not. I'm really hearing things. I believe you, I do, she said, rubbing his back. But how do we know you don't have an ear infection or something worse? Meningitis, or it's not meningitis. I don't have a fever. Even Dad would tell you that. On some level, she knew he was right, and so she struck a deal. If he wasn't better in the morning, they would pack their bags and go. He didn't raise even one objection, and that too worried her. 
Under any other circumstance, he would insist he was fine, enduring a headache or a stuffed up nose while he cast his line into the river. That night, as she lay in her sleeping bag, she turned her head and willed the hum or the drone or whatever it was Quinn had heard to come to her to receive her invitation. Once she thought she heard a man talking, the voice ragged and eerily distant, but when she sat up, she saw it was Quinn moaning into his pillow. The next morning they drove home and within two days were sitting in Dr. Benton's office. The doctor interviewed Quinn, listened attentive, attentively, and asked various questions about the sounds he was hearing. It might be tinnitus, the doctor said, but with no concrete evidence of a malady, I'm at a loss as to what's going on here. It could be an environmental issue or industrial. His voice trailed off and he looked at Quinn. It's also possible, and perhaps more likely, you're hearing things that just aren't there. His tone was gentle, apologetic, and he said he'd like to suggest the name of a therapist who might have some better ideas. Claire called Owen to tell him what the doctor had said. When he picked up, she could barely hear him over the baby crying and Beth insisting in a bitter voice that Owen called her back later. Look, he said, this isn't a good time. Owen, she said, Quinn's in trouble, serious trouble. What are you saying, Claire? I'm saying he's hearing things. Insects, people, aliens, I, I don't know. Dr. Benton doesn't know either. Owen was quiet then. The baby continued to cry, and all at once he said, Jesus, Beth, will you take her into the other room? Owen's tone stunned Claire, and a mixture of sadness and rapture wrestled for the spot in her brain that had wanted Owen to suffer. Now she understood that he was in no better place than when he left her, and this small bit of assurance gave her the confidence to tell him she handled Quinn on her own. As she stood at the picnic table across from the ranger station, she worried that Quinn was injured that maybe he'd tried to use his cell, but hadn't been able to reach her. She jogged over to the ranger station, knowing that someone would be there to help her. Then when she got to the door, she saw a sign in large black letters, closed for the season, see you next spring. She rattled the knob ferociously. When it didn't budge, she ran across the parking lot toward the information center. Ruth and Duncan Barnes manned the department, and they would have a phone, a landline, and would do whatever they could to help her. The door was propped open, and inside, a ceiling fan slowly stirred the air. The room was dimly lit. Cardboard boxes were scattered about, some half-filled, their lids flopped open, others neatly stacked. Fifties music played from an office toward the back. Hello, Claire called. Ruth, are you there? The music softened, and Ruth appeared at the door. Why, Claire, she said brightly. What a lovely surprise. Then her face shifted as though something had just occurred to her, and she said, what are you doing here? Well, here at the office? No, dear. Here it does it. Claire's head felt thick all at once, and she couldn't recall why she'd come. And then she remembered her canvas sack. I'm on litter patrol, she said, holding up the bag to show Ruth. Claire's gaze traveled to the boxes in the room. You're not moving, are you? The Park Service had a habit of shifting people from building to building, which was difficult on everyone. No one liked to have give up a desk or an office or parking space once they claimed it as their own. We're close for the season, Ruth said. Duncan and I were just boxing up. Now Duncan, too, came to the door, his arm full of books. Claire, he said, eyebrows rising. What brings you to Dulcet? She's on litter patrol, Ruth said, her blue eyes communicating some secret code, which Duncan was slow to pick up on. Ruth nudged him with her elbow. Litter patrol, she said again, enunciating each word carefully as if Duncan might not get it. Ah, yes, he muttered, his brows now deeply furrowed. We really had no idea you were volunteering, Claire. We thought you were back at Berkeley. Well, I've been here since June, she said, astonished. And then, well, Quinn and I have been here all season. Haven't you seen us on the trail? Oh, Claire, Ruth said with a little gasp. She stepped forward and embraced Claire, her breath warm against Claire's cheek. It broke our hearts to hear about Quinn. He was a beautiful, brilliant child. She rested her hands on Claire's shoulders. I can only imagine what you're going through. What can we do to help? Find him, Claire said incredulous. He's out on the trail somewhere. She didn't wait for Ruth's reply, but turned, walked through the door and across the parking lot. Ruth called after her repeatedly, saying, Claire, come back, please, dear. We'll look for Quinn together. Something about the timbre of Ruth's voice unsettled Claire and brought to mind another voice. How many months ago? A woman, a stranger from San Francisco, had shown up at her house for a gathering. Quinn's graduation, perhaps. 
A handful of Quinn's friends had come, and Owen, and his new wife, Beth. There was food on the table in the dining room, and coffee on the sidebar. While Claire had assumed some measure of frivolity, the guests were entirely stoic. Owen had assembled the group with a clink to his glass, acknowledging Claire as a devoted mother and their son as a troubled soul. The remark confounded Claire, and she thought she might tell him so, but then the woman from San Francisco approached her privately, saying she needed to talk. Claire assumed the woman was one of Quinn's teachers and was there to share a compliment or perhaps an anecdote. Your son and I made contact on the bridge that day, the woman told her, and he seemed very, very nervous. I said, are you all right? And he said, it's a long way down. I never saw him jump. The woman gripped Claire's arm and her eyes as blue as Ruth's filled with sudden tears. Now, Claire turned a half circle in the parking lot and gazed at the horizon, where cedars lined a rounded ridge line like quills on the curve of the moon. A sharp breeze brushed her shoulders. It was getting late, and she needed to get back to the campsite. Quinn was no doubt waiting for her, and they had some trout to catch.